Interesting to hear from Arup Roshan. Uh, he's a distinguished uh, engineer and CTO of financial services at IBM, and he's going to talk to us uh, about how to make banking more uh, invisible. Uh, welcome, Barat. Thank you, John, um, and thank you for having me. I really, really appreciate it. Um, so I really loved the content from Olivier in terms of the behavioral science, and it's something that we've seen uh, more, becoming more and more important to to our clients. Um, uh, uh, certainly over the last few years, it's um, it's super interesting. So I'll, I'll bring some of that uh, into um, into the discussion as well. So please give me a thumbs up if you can see my screens okay. I can see your screen and it's okay. uh, perfect. Uh, okay, brilliant. Um, so, uh, so I think you know the the. So, so my name is Bharat Bishan. I um, am an IBM Distinguished Engineer and CTO for Banking and Financial Markets. My job is to work with clients across uh, EMEA and actually around the world in solving complex uh, business problems. The topic of this discussion is where we see as a company, uh, having worked with you know, hundreds of clients, how the industry is evolving. Um, and Olivia already touched on a number of these things, so um, so there's a lot of parallels to be to be drawn here. We want to kind of look back over the last five years, um, specifically now in the last two to three years, uh, two years as as with the lens of COVID nineteen, some of these industry challenges have really accentuated. Um, so there's, there was always, at least in um, in Western Europe, there were negative interest rates or very very close to zero interest rates in in most of the European countries. So there was always a bit of a pressure on uh, on shareholder demands and improving um, either return on equity or uh, improving cost efficiency in the business to then also having these um, uh, the disruption and the challenges from fintechs and big techs, you know, organizations either nibbling away at parts of your, your business um, or potentially bringing your competitors in to, to create new platforms that can take customer stickiness, that customer interaction away from you and generally one in ten dollars that is spent in in a bank or ten pounds ten euros ten you know one in ten rupees whatever you you currency generally globally speaking we find that approximately 10 to 15 percent of the the total spend in a bank is spent on regulatory activity so that might be um, collating all the data producing reports demonstrating compliance changing your it systems people processes um, to demonstrate compliance to regulations that are changing um, pretty much every single day, uh, and especially over the last um, 12 months, uh, our customers have seen nearly 600% increase in phishing attacks and and cyber attacks on them uh, due to COVID-19. As um, and I've you know I've firsthand seen this, uh, getting text messages that pretend to be from uh, the tax office, from your bank, uh, from your mobile phone uh, provider to broadband. You know everyone's trying to. And, and these phishing attacks have become very, very sophisticated um, to the point where it's very hard to distinguish between a, um, a scam website where they're trying to get your payment details, your bank details, your identity um, to the one that is that is pretty real. So banks are really concerned around that. In fact, just uh, just earlier this morning, as I was skimming through the the, the kind of the latest news, um, a lot of the European and particularly TSP, one of our clients in the UK, is calling on digital platforms um, such as social media platforms to really work hard on identifying scam um, links and advertisements because a lot of the scam is happening through, um, through through those platforms. But all of that change, now I'm going to kind of get narrowed down into why I think the future of banking is invisible, where banks will continue to, let me expand on that first, what I mean by that is banks will continue to exist. You know, we need banks. We need banks to keep our money, our data, our identities um, safe. And particularly this statement is true for incumbent banks, regardless of their shape and size, is that they have the trust of the of the end customer. Many of them have been around for uh, for for some in some instances, you know, hundreds of years, um, and they're there to serve the customer. The regulators are also uh, providing assurance that your money is safe um, with those financial institutions. But as you look at the the market, really, you, you see organizations that are good at producing products. You see organizations that are slowly starting to get into the distribution model where particularly challenger banks, as they come in with a digital wallet offering or perhaps only a deposit account to start with, um, and to in, in, a, in an order to, in a view to create um, a sustainable revenue stream, they're looking to distribute 
third-party products as well as some of the um, banks that I can you know you, you look at um, Starling Bank in the UK uh, Monzo and a number of other challenger banks um, around the world you know they start to bring third-party products in and provide uh, that 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 ability to um, to integrate those third parties in a way that is seamless uh, from an end customer perspective I love some of the comments that Olivia were making around messaging platforms webhooks uh, the ability because of all those patterns um, are very uh, varied. You know, there's there's lots of different patterns in um, in in, in um, uh, the data might flow from customer to the bank to uh, the third party. In some instances, from the customer referral to the third party, and and the third party connecting back to the bank in a variety of ways as those events happen, not in a in a batch based um, processing. And that eventual consistency uh, uh, framework is also very useful to to bear in mind as financial institutions move to to the new world where they're, they're no longer in the business of creating their own products in the back office and then selling them through their own front office, i.e. a branch or a mobile or internet banking app. The future is, is effectively being able to create new platforms or participate in other platforms. And therefore, you take advantage of the network effects that that platform perhaps has already generated. And you're you're leveraging that to um, to 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 create that 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 value add, um, and I'm going to give you some examples of how what does that look like in in reality. So you know here's an example of um, and some of these are you know, IBM examples where we have had the opportunity to work with clients across multiple industries. And the other thing I observe is that the the boundaries between the industries is blurring very very quickly. Where um, one of the reasons I think you know banking would be invisible is banks are we know that branches are generally shrinking in, in terms of their shape their size and number of branches that that banks hold um, in any given country you know that this is a global um, trend and um, more and more branches are translating are, are transforming into almost like a help desk where many of our clients say look our customers come into a branch when something doesn't work on a mobile app or internet banking or even the contact center, they have no choice but to come in. And therefore, we have to be digitally advanced uh, to ensure that our customers have self-service and they can do everything from you know, chatbots to, um, to video calling within the mobile app itself. So people don't have to come into a branch, uh, but uh, we still have to sell those products. Now, those examples that I'm going to share with you are real live examples of, of how banks have embedded banking services in other industries, in the industries of their clients. So particularly if any of you are working in a large corporate bank or you're working in a large corporation, you, know, you are dealing with money at some point. You are either lending, you're, you're selling a consumer product, um, and you want to aggregate that money. You, want, you don't want to, um, uh, you want treasury and cash management type of services. This is where financial institutions are coming in, and they're building those experiences for large corporates customers in those platforms itself, you know, in this case, Hello Tractor is effectively an Uber, uh, where if a farmer uh, in certain parts of Africa, if they if they call uh, Hello Tractor, a, a tractor turns up with specific equipment uh, that is designed to do a specific task um, in the fields. Um, the advantage of doing platforms like this for the farming community was that you know they 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 couldn't afford uh, to get um, expensive farm equipment, but they could get that equipment that is needed for the right time at the right job, so less reliance on uh, manual laborers that could take you know, a tenfold uh, amount of time and might not even turn up on time uh, in, in most occasions. The the value for, um, for the manufacturer in this case was to get into the predictive maintenance aspect, particularly as we look at you know industrial sector, particularly in the car, planes, uh, and um, various um, uh, vehicles as they are constructed today. Um, there's there's lots of data that that those devices, those um, instruments and and machines are generating, which could be used for predictive maintenance, as well as putting digital secure wallets in those devices as well. And I'll come back to that in a, in a few minutes. Some of the work that we're doing with um, some of the German car manufacturers, but in this instance, you know, the bank's uh, um, use case was to effectively facilitate payments, to create digital wallets for the uh, for the farmers. And actually, in this instance, eventually create a better credit profile for the farmer as well, so they are uh, they can they can lend to those uh, those farmers uh, better. Here's another example where, um, by creating a logistical uh, platform for very small vendors in in Kenya, 
um, they were able to get uh, micro loans. Now, in this instance, you will see that uh, that, that there's there's a there's an ecosystem at play. There's the farmers, there's the community of of um, small um, sellers, as well as the logistical um, players as well, all providing value to the end customer. In this case, it is the it is the actual you know farmer or a, a, a food uh, grocer, a seller, uh, on the side of the street getting perhaps only thirty dollars a a day loan, but that could be transformational for them. But also getting insights. So there's no va no point in just providing all of these platforms, but no insight. So you know, in this in all of the examples that I've shared so far, maybe I'll narrow down into into here another example, which is again agri agriculture uh, example. You can see the theme here. But in this instance, Bank of Baroda, one of the biggest uh, banks in India for, far, uh, for the farming community, um, working with us really created a whole ecosystem of, um, of things that a farmer needs in India. And, uh, you know, most of, most of um, given that this conference is happening in Singapore, and I, see, I think a lot of people will be able to relate to this, that the farming community in India, generally speaking, it's a multi-generational uh, fa uh, family business. Um, many farmers, particularly in the elderly generation, were uneducated. They were not really digitally savvy uh, customers. So what um, what Bank of Baroda did was created the last mile of advisory services. These are people that sit in those communities, in those villages, in the local branches that understand uh, farmers. They have the trust of of these farmers. And you know, Bank of Baroda is the, is the type of bank where the farmers would come in with an empty checkbook. Um, and we trust the banker to fill out the forms and, and do everything for them. Now, most of my Western um, clients actually fall off their chair when you talk about trust in that respect, uh, and the trust in <clears throat> in Southeast Asia um, on on the bank is you know much much bigger than than it, it it is in in North America and particularly in Western Europe. But in this instance, you know the the bank really looked at the whole life cycle of um, of a farmer's day, a week, a year. And look at you know how can we help the farmer go get the best quality seeds at the best price, and then get that final produce um, to the to the best price. So they don't always go to the same buyer and the seller in the uh, in in the markets, uh, but actually provide the whole ecosystem from um, logistic suppliers as well. The benefit to the bank was again you know providing digital services to digital wallets. So effectively, the the farmer is not no longer dealing with cash, and particularly some of the demonetization. Um, um, policies in India helped with the adoption of platforms like this. Uh, but providing that whole ecosystem, uh, banks uh, still continue to do their the, the, what they're really good at, which is um, lending, payments, insurance, and other financial products. Um, let me give you another example of um, State Bank of India, um, where SBI came up with the, the, the largest um, uh, bank in India, state-owned bank, um, over 400 million customers in uh, in India uh, and over 16,000 branches. But they created this vision of creating a lifestyle app where if you are an SBI customer, you can see your balances and, and so on. But actually, the most, much more interesting thing here is that as you, and I suspect many of you listening to this event are an SBI customer, um, and when you go into this, some of these options, you know, you can you can do everything that you, anything that you do on a daily basis from booking your travels, well, well, when we can to um, your experiences and uh, buying everything from your daily groceries to uh, perhaps um, the most expensive things in life um, uh, and most treasured um, things in life as well. Now, in this instance, you know, they really went after localization using analytics, using cloud computing, using, of course, you know, APIs. In all of the examples that I have taken show so far, APIs are the backbone of um, of creating these experiences. But you can create these experiences in, in a variety of ways um, through either, as I said, in some countries this is this is allowed, uh, where you can earn a referral fee by by um, recommending a customer a third party product. In some instances, it is not allowed. Um, so you know the, the the but the ultimate view is that the experience of the customer, in most instances, will stay within within the app, so that the branding that the customer is used to is is SBI. You know, um, when you're trying to book a train ticket or a plane ticket, you get to see that uh, from here. As a bank, you get to understand your customers better. You know that uh, that Bharat is traveling from Delhi to Bangalore, you know, one twice a week or uh, twice in a month. 
um, uh, and you know that you know he is potentially working there, but his family lives in other parts of the uh, the country. You might also see that, and therefore there, there's potential services around um, travel and transport bookings from and to the airports. If I'm booking an international traveler, you can see that I'm I'm a frequent international traveler. Uh, so that therefore potentially looking at uh, FX rates and insurance and health insurance and travel insurance, all of those things that, that financial institutions are good at, but providing them and selling them to the client in the context of their customer journey. And this is where I think I loved what Olivier was talking about in terms of uh, behavioral science. So we are doing a lot of work in that space at the moment where analytics um, and some of the work that we did with uh, USAA, one of the largest financial institutions in, in America, where as you look at life events, and a life event might be you know, somebody somebody's children graduating from school um, or uh, perhaps someone buying a new house, uh, potentially becoming a parent, et cetera, uh, you know, looking at those that data and analytics, potentially the potential to influence a customer in terms of product decision is before that event happens. And with most circumstances, with you know, over 90% accuracy, you can determine when a life event might happen. And therefore, there's a window of opportunity where you can advise the customer, nudge and coach the customer in making a better financial decision. And you know, for me, it is, uh, you know, I can tell you that over 60% of um, uh, Brits have zero savings. And particularly if you look at the, uh, the pandemic and the, the influence of the pandemic, um, a lot of people were, were furloughed. So if you can nudge people into using behavioral science, analytics, and AI, into making better decisions in saving you know, 10 pounds more a month, uh, that could have a significant impact um, over the course of uh, their lifetime. Let me give you some more examples on how people have actually gone about delivering those platforms. So you know, this is, these are all IBM examples using uh, APIs, you know, Nodia, one of our most um, treasured um, clients. You can see that they are going, to, going beyond just the PS22 and open banking APIs that banks in Europe are forced to provide free of charge actually going into corporate lending, you know, payments, uh, instant reporting, cash management, treasury management type of services um, as well. You know, City, um, and some of you might work for City actually, um, and they have a big presence in, in, in Southeast uh, Asia, but they crossed over a billion dollar, uh, a billion API calls purely from their corporate uh, uh, clients. So imagine the amount of innovation that other corporates are doing, non-banks, um, in terms of embedding APIs into banking and banking APIs and banking products um, in their ecosystems. I know I'm running shorter time, so I'm just going to, uh, you know, I can't come to a technical conference and not talk about um, architectures. So typically, you know, when we think about how do we build uh, these services, you know, there's a lot of moving parts and Olivia already touched on effectively these, these red arrows, you know, how you effectively integrate these services and the integration patterns and the integration strategy is so critical to the success of this uh, the, the platforms like this because you will have peaks and troughs. You will have instances where perhaps um, over a million customers are trying to log in at the same time. You know, SBI actually get nearly five million logins um, a day. A majority of them are peaked in the mornings and in the evenings. Um, and so, creating an architecture that is scalable. And event driven because you know you have the flexibility to provide a seamless customer experience without having to have lock in um, APIs and providing synchronous um, uh, kind of architecture, which historically has been the case for most uh, financial institutions. Um, then there is also you know the value of um, uh, data uh, as well. In 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 a lot of instances, what what I see is that effectively data is continuously being collected based on customer interactions, based on external data. So in the case of Bank of Baroda and other uh, platforms that I mentioned earlier, they're using the IBM weather company that provides the weather data information um, and using that in context of the client, in context of what they're doing. So if I'm um, uh, traveling and you can tell me, hey, you know, it's going to, at least in Britain, it's going to rain tomorrow, I can be better prepared, uh, et cetera. So data, um, your integration, technologies and the architectural decisions you're going to make um, is super important. And the other thing that, that we learned by working with, with these um, clients is that IT in some instances, it might sound um, uh, uh, quite strange uh, because you know usually you, you hear the opposite. In when teams are organized properly, IT can deliver faster than business can consume. So what one of the things we learned was 
actually bringing someone from the line of business, a program management and a product owner working together so that those business sign-offs can happen as quickly as it needs to be uh, is, is a super cool um, thing to set up because those are the foundational blocks in how quickly um, you can go to market. So I'm just going to wrap up. You know, we've touched on industry trends, you know, major changes happening in the industry. Uh, financial institutions around the world are under immense pressure due to COVID-19 and historically, at least in the in the Western world, uh, due to the financial crisis, which seems like uh, a long time ago and almost not memorable in 2007, 2008, but banks were just about coming out of that um, in the US and in, in Europe. But but now the, with the pandemic, this is going to take even, even longer. And therefore, financial institutions have to find new ways of making money, finding new ways to be relevant to their clients, and they have to go where their clients are, whether it's a corporate client, whether it's a retail client, whether it's a small to medium-sized business. Um, banks are really focusing on helping small to medium-sized businesses by embedding online accounting services, cash management, uh, and a whole raft of other supply chain um, type issues where banks historically had never been there before. But this is a new world that we are living in, and I think, I think that's the future for financial institutions, particularly as other industries are also beginning to open up and everyone is focusing on customer centricity. You know, you look at any uh, annual report from any industry, everyone, the first thing they have, their strategic objective is to be client centric, to, to put their customers first. Um, so I'd encourage you to uh, register to our upcoming major event, IBM Think, uh, which is um, happening next month. Um, uh, and also some of the some of really cool um, developer centric uh, cloud native uh, development courses as well that you can take. You can earn your badge um, and proudly display it on your on your LinkedIn profile. There's tons of um, developer patterns as well. You know, 200 developer patterns, uh, development patterns that you can download and accelerate your your journey to building platforms like this using open source technologies um, and creating uh, a, a cloud native um, architecture as well. So there's tons more content. You know, I've shared these slides with the um, with, with the organizers. You you can ask for a copy of these slides um, if you if you like to. And with that, uh, John, perhaps I can um, stop here and see if there's any questions or comments. Sure. Um, thanks very much for that, uh, Bharat, uh, for that for that picture. I guess the we have just one very short minute for for a question. And um, great that you picked picked. Um, Painted a picture of the of the architecture. I was interested in the, the orchestrating a marketplace um, idea uh, because that's not just the techno. Tech, you have to need the technical pieces in place, but then the business people within the bank need to be thinking about who to partner with. How would you create yeah. that that uh, or foster that that marketplace model, like you mentioned, the Bank of Baroda model for farmers. Uh, has a number of different players. So, um, yes. what are the um, in in thirty seconds? What what are the extra skills that bankers need to develop yeah. to think outside the the bank? Yes. So there's two types of onboarding. Uh, there's a business onboarding and a technical onboarding. On the business side, you really want to understand is this organization mature enough to work with uh, with a bank. On the technical side of onboarding, you need a sandbox environment so that you can start to do some early prototyping and have the ability to influence your the products of those organizations as well, uh, because that will change. They will have to change with you. So you're getting into a co-creation mode on the bank side and on the partner side. It, it, you, you can't have um, a one party wins all scenario. It has to be a win-win scenario for all. Mm. All right, thanks, uh, thanks very much for that perspective. Great Thank you for having me, John. Thank you. No, it's, it's been a pleasure. I've, uh, I've I've had the opportunity to come back for third year in a row, which is uh, um, scary. But uh, thank you for having me. I, I really enjoy coming to this event and and speaking to 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 all the attendees. Thank you. Thank you.